Uh, my background and uh, perspective is from biophysics and physical biochemistry. And uh, although I am on occasions involved in, in teaching um, medical students, and I know from that experience that bioenergetics is one of those topics that one meets once and forgets and, or about very quickly, or at least never re-encounters. So I'm going to give uh, <coughs> maybe a fairly extensive introduction uh, with the aim of telling you what I do rather than in very great details and especially why I do it. Uh, and um, bioenergetics, uh, as you will in general have met it, uh, is in the context of uh, the mitochondrial activities. Uh, bioenergetics can be usefully defined as, uh, I guess mine doesn't work, let's try this one. Yes can be usefully defined as uh, looking at the thermodynamics, the energetics, as well as the mechanisms of how organisms obtain energy from the environment, and it can come in in a variety of ways, and convert it into the energetic uh, elements of metabolism, of which the predominant one that one thinks of is ATP, but also a lot of transport processes and a lot of other um, so-called high energy chemicals that we, uh, that we encounter. So in mitochondria, the energy comes in in the form of food, and uh, the process there is to convert the, the inherent free energy, which is bound up in specific kinds of electrons uh, involved that, that are accessible through oxidation reduction reactions, and to convert that into, into these other diverse forms. And uh, the underlying or sort of grand vision of how this is done is due to this man, Peter Mitchell, who uh, uh, devised, a, a, at the time, a really radical way of thinking about how organisms do this. And uh, he devised something which we think of now as called the chemiosmotic theory of biological energy conversion. And the idea here is that uh, electrons stripped off from, uh, from food molecules are fed into a sequence of oxidation reduction reactions called an electron transport chain, which uh, is bound up in very large and complicated membrane molecules in the mitochondrial membrane, or as we will see in the cell membrane of, of bacteria. And as the electrons pass through this chain, various steps of the reactions are coupled to proton translocation across the membrane so that the free energy in the reducing power that originated with food uh, is converted into a gradient of protons, an electrochemical gradient, and that is in a delocalized source of free energy which can be converted into other forms, for example, transport or uh, ATP synthesis. Um, so we actually now know the, the structures of most of the major molecules involved in, for example, the mitochondrial electron transport chain, starting with the NADH dehydrogenase, of which we know the, uh, the portion that's outside of the membrane. We still don't know the structure of the membrane portion. Succinate dehydrogenase, the, uh, the cytochrome BC1 complex, cytochrome oxidase, all of these receive these electrons passed down in a sequence of reactions and various steps pump or translocate or react in the, a variety of uh, mechanistic ways to move protons from the inside of the mitochondrion to the outside, generating a gradient which can then be used <coughs> to drive protons through other work producing uh, uh, membrane structures like the ATPase. Now, uh, this hypothesis, or is now elevated to the level of a theory, uh, the chemiosmotic uh, theory, is uh, universal. It's found in all the major energy conserving forms of, of uh, metabolism and in all forms of life, so that it's located in or, or found in situations of respiration, both aerobic and anaerobic, methanogenesis, photosynthesis, and in all the life forms. Uh, uh, within uh, the archaea, eukaryotes, and bacteria. Um, and just to remind you that in the case of uh, microbes or prokaryotes, the electron transport chain is, the, uh, uh, is found in the cell membrane, and, uh, which is the sort of um, the analog of the mitochondrial membrane. 
So my own interest and, and work in this area comes from a long t uh, my, my beginnings. We have a sort of historical perspective amongst some of us, uh, uh, the older members of this, uh, of this group here. Uh, I, it comes from uh, starting off in the area of photosynthesis. So I work with photosynthetic organisms and in particular with a photosynthetic bacterium. And there the electron transport chain is pared down to a rather convenient minimum. The energetic electrons which go into the electron transport chain are actually obtained by uh, the input of light. So r low energy electrons are elevated to a high energy level. And two turnovers of a protein known as the photosynthetic reaction center produces uh, a quinol, reduces a quinone to a quinol. The quinol comes out, diffuses in the membrane to meet up with a cytochrome BC1 complex, which is completely equivalent to the one found in mitochondria. Uh, there the quinol is oxidized to quinone, which then cycles back to the reaction center. The electrons go through a rather complicated pathway in the BC1 complex, come out to a cytochrome C, and then are donated back to the reaction center. So the actual electron transport reaction here is cyclical, and the, the only sort of net gain of free energy is the gradient of protons, which is generated uh, by uh, a couple of steps within this cyclic pathway. So uh, reaction centers, or photosynth photosynthetic systems in general, uh, convert light energy into two basic forms. One is reducing power, which is distributed to other membrane complexes like the BC1 complex, and the other is an electrochemical gradient, which includes both a true electrical potential, because electrons are moved across the membrane, the insulating layer of the membrane, uh, in a, a process I'll show you in a moment, uh, and also protons are taken up, so that's part of the electrochemical uh, energy conversion. So what I want to uh, sort of emphasize at this point is that for a variety of reasons, which I hope will become quickly apparent, bioenergetic proteins are really, I believe, an ideal system for studying the true essence of how proteins work in a very general sense. So what I'm interested in is how proteins work. It turns out that bioenergetic proteins, and in particular, photosynthetic ones have attributes which allow you to ask very, very detailed but very general questions about how proteins do essentially everything, including be enzymes, uh, be antibodies, uh, be signaling cofactors, etc., etc. And the reason for that is that the, the essential the centers where electron transfer takes place in a, a redox <laughs> enzyme, of which uh, bioenergetic proteins are sort of the quintessence, ha are cofactors which have phenomenally detailed and very striking and very intense spectroscopic properties, which makes them very observable. And you can't learn much without being able to observe something. So we know that f we learn as soon as we enter into the field of biology that proteins really can do anything. Whether they do do anything, of course, depends on whether it's useful evolutionarily speaking. But they can do any, anything, it seems. Uh, with the sort of insight that we get from choosing the right system, we can ask how they do it. And just to, so, as some examples, and what I really want to focus on is that we know that um, a protein, different proteins, can take the same chemical and make it do entirely different things. So heme, of which there are actually several, but if, if you just took one particular heme, a, a B heme, the same kind of heme that you find in hemoglobin or myoglobin, you find exactly the same chemical in hemoglobin. You also find it in B-type cytochromes. Uh, for example, the, the cytochromes which are involved in the, uh, the leukocyte uh, burst that, um, dispel, that, that dispenses with infections by spraying hydrogen peroxide all over the place. Uh, it's also found in certain uh, cytochrome oxidases. And within these different proteins, the same heme chemical has exceedingly different properties, which we characterize as being redox potential. And that redox potential can vary as much as the equivalent acid-base property of a PK is different in, say, sodium hydroxide compared to hydrochloric acid. So the protein environment of these cofactors makes them just entirely different. Um, we also 
can see this kind of diversity of effect that proteins have when we think about the, uh, the visual spectrum of, of red, blue, and green rhodopsins. You have a very wide range of, uh, of color, and that color is imposed on the same chemical, which is retinal, by the environment of the protein. And similarly, we see it in photosynthetic uh, structures, uh, where the pigment which is being imposed upon is chlorophyll or bacteria chlorophyll. So it turns out then that the reaction center, and this happens to be the reaction center from a bacterium, has a remarkable property which allows you to ask how on earth do proteins do this? So this is the, the structure of the reaction center from a particular bacterium that I work on. It consists of three protein subunits. Two of them are in the membrane, so the membrane is along the middle here. And the two in the membrane, the two subunits in the membrane are highly homologous. They're called the L subunit and the M subunit. And they bind all of the cofactors that are involved in, uh, uh, in light energy conversion. And these cofactors amount to four bacteria chlorophylls, two bacteria pheophytins, which are chlorophylls without the magnesium, and two quinones. And you can see that the arrangement of the cofactors, but it also turns out the arrangement of the proteins, is very highly symmetrical. If you drew a line from here to here, then there would be a two-fold rotational axis. So we have these uh, cofactors which are present in chemically identical pairs. There are two bacteria chlorophylls down here, which are actually a dimer, and that's where the light energy is first uh, taken and converted into, uh, into redox energy. There are two more bacteria chlorophylls here, two pheophytins, and then two quinones. But the electron transfer only occurs down this pathway. So they're chemically identical, seemingly, and yet functionally exceedingly asymmetrical. So we have the ideal situation where we can say, what is the difference between the environment of this pheophytin and that pheophytin, which makes this one active and this one not active? Or in the case of the, the majority of the work that we carry out, these two quinones, where although they are chemically identical, they're both ubiquinone, the same, the same as found in mitochondria, um, they are chemically identical and yet functionally quite distinct. And uh, this is just to emphasize the spectroscopy that's uh, available with a system like this and, and makes so much of our sort of very detailed but I hope highly generalizable uh, conclusions possible. This is the spectrum of the reaction center. Uh, this peak out here at about 860 nanometers is predominantly associated with the two bacteria chlorophylls that form the, what's called the primary photopigment or primary donor. This peak here comes from these two bacteria chlorophylls. This peak here comes from these two pheophytins. And then everything else also absorbs substantially elsewhere. But the point I wanted to make is that uh, these are very intense absorbance bands. These reaction centers are a beautiful sky blue color. Uh, and uh, it also emphasizes that these bacteria chlorophylls absorb at a very different place from these two bacteria chlorophylls because the, the uh, protein environment around them is very different. But because of this kind of spectroscopy, we know that electron transfer starts from an excited state of this primary donor. It proceeds across the membrane, the, the electron is ejected and proceeds across the membrane. It reaches this point in about three picoseconds. It goes from here to here in about 200 picoseconds, and from here to here in about 10 microseconds. It turns out that measuring picosecond kinetics, if you have the right spectroscopy, is really easy. Uh, so long, of course, as you have a half a million dollars worth of spectroscopic equipment. But uh, technically speaking, it's actually very straightforward. So I'm going to focus on the reactions at this last part here, where the electron arrives across the membrane to this primary quinone called QA, and then it's transferred to the secondary quinone, QB. And then with a second turnover, uh, the, this quinone is fully reduced to the quinol. It comes out of the reaction center like a converted substrate and is replaced by a quinone. So this just summarizes what happens. On the first flash, we, we reduce the primary quinone. And that quinone is then able to transfer its electron in a favorable forward direction to the secondary quinone. And the electron just hangs around there, waiting for the next turnover. So we form a stable anionic semiquinone. The second turnover starts off with the reaction center in a slightly different state. The secondary quinone is already singly reduced. Uh, photoactivation reduces the primary quinone again. 
and now that second electron is transferred to the secondary quinone, protons are taken up, quinol is formed, comes out, etc. Okay? So there are two important things to note here. First of all, although these are chemically identical, the environment around them makes it possible for the, the first electron to be favorably transferred to the secondary quinone. So there's a, there's a change in, or difference in the, in the electron affinity or the redox potential of the second quinone compared to the first quinone, so the electron always goes forward. And also, uh, even on the second electron transfer, there is a forward electron transfer equilibrium which favors the right-hand side. Okay? And the other thing to note is that on the second electron transfer here, both protons are taken up. So this is the same sequence here, starting off with the second electron tra uh, activation to reduce QA. In fact, before that electron is transferred, this semiquinone picks up a proton, forms a neutral semiquinone, and then the second electron is transferred, and then the second proton is taken up. Okay? So there's a lot of specialized equipment around this secondary quinone that makes these, uh, these issues possible. So the challenge is to design or imagine how the protein is designed in this secondary quinone region that allows, first of all, the electron transfers to be favorable in both cases between two otherwise seemingly identical chemicals, but also how, the, how this uh, arrangement can, f can be designed to favor electron transfer to QB, and electrons, remember, are negatively charged, but also to allow for protons to be transferred, and protons are positively charged. And it turns out that almost everything that proteins do do is based on electrostatics, so this is a little bit of a conundrum. So all of this act activity, this design activity, if you like, takes place in this region, uh, which I call the, uh, the QB acidic cluster, because it turns out that there are an enormous number of acidic residues here. This has the highest density of ionizable residues known in any protein that's so far been identified. So here is the secondary quinone uh, down here. If you're able to do cross-eyed stereo, that's what this figure is. If you can't, don't worry, it's probably not very important. And I've only labeled one side anyway, which means if you can do it, you kind of get a headache after a few minutes. Um, so this is the acidic cluster. This is the surface of the protein out here. There are a cluster of histidine residues on the surface. And it turns out that uh, because of the density of ionizable residues here, there's a very, very complicated interplay of electrostatic interactions, which makes it both complicated to understand, but also very interesting to try and understand. Okay, so in, in addition to there being a high density of acidic residues here, it turns out that most of them are ionized. These are buried residues, so you might think that it would be difficult to bury a charge, and in general that's kind of a nice way to start thinking, but it turns out that almost all of these residues are either ionized or partially ionized, and since they're mostly negative, almost inevitably there must be some kind of counterbalance of pluses. So there's a few pluses around here. There's a lysine here, there's an arginine there, but the vast majority of the countercharge to the negative charges that we see on these acidic residues comes from a generalized positive potential inside the protein which arises from the dipoles of the peptides. In other words, it's a backbone potential. And we don't sort of tend to pay much attention to it. Nevertheless, so there is a, an underlying positive potential here, and that allows most of these ionizable acidic residues to be actually negatively charged. But I don't know whether it's right to say it allows it or it's required, because you couldn't have one without the other. Uh, now, when we look at the properties of the secondary quinone, it turns out that uh, the, the major contributors to the favorable reduction of QB comes from or is controlled by the overall electrostatics but with particular contributions from these two residues, an agglutamic acid which is residue 212 in the L subunit and an aspartic acid which is residue 213 in the L subunit. Um, so this is how we identify or the beginnings of how we identify that these residues are important. If we look at the equilibrium constant but well, one electron between the first quinone and the second quinone and we look at it as a function of pH, as you change the pH of the medium, 
then you're going to protonate or deprotonate different groups. You're going to change the net charge of the protein in a, in a fairly progressive fashion as we go up in pH. Things will become deprotonated and more negative. So if we look at the black line here, this is this, the value of this equilibrium constant. And note that this is logarithmic, so it's uh, changing fairly dramatically. At low pH, it has a value on the order of, say, 50. That's the equilibrium constant between the left and the right-hand side. As we raise the pH, the equilibrium constant gets smaller. And that's associated with the ionization of this aspartic acid. As it becomes ionized, its negative charge inhibits the transfer of the negative electron to QB. Then in neutral pH region, the, P the equilibrium constant is fairly constant. And then as we go to higher pH, we find that it becomes un more and more unfavorable. It turns out as this glutamic acid ionizes. So an yet another negative charge is put near the secondary quinone, which inhibits the transfer of the negative electron. Okay? Uh, this is a fairly typical pK for a carboxylate, around 5, say. This is an unusually high pK uh, for a carboxylate, um, and that arises both from the fact that it's buried, but also it's interacting with a number of other groups. So now, uh, the way, uh, part of how we understand what's going on here is to uh, site-directed mutations. So we've done a lot of mutational work on this acid cluster. Um, and let's just imagine what might happen. Uh, since the ionization of these acidic residues is dependent to a large extent on there being a positive charge to allow them to be ionized, so in other words, we have more or less electrostatic neutrality, if we take away one of these negative charges, we can expect that some of the others will further ionize and try and compensate for that loss of negative charge because there's more positive charge out there still to be compensated, okay, and more positive potential. Um, so if we, if we target one, and let's target this residue here, aspartic acid L213, if we mutate it to an asparagine, which is neutral at all pH, then it would be interesting to see what happens. So we mutate it. Okay? Uh, taking away that negative charge allows other charges to become more predominant. So this residue, which was only partially ionized, now becomes if I can find my finger, fully ionized. And this one, which was partially ionized, has become more, but still partially ionized. So the, we take away one negative charge, and there's a tendency for this whole kind of networked and compensating system to make up for the negative charge we've taken away. But the, the charge that we've taken away is very close to QB, which is where all the action's taking place. So even though we have compensated by increasing the negative charge elsewhere, we still get a loss of negative potential in the region of the, uh, uh, of the secondary quinone, or, or in other words, a more positive potential than we had before. So when we look at the effect of this mutant, we find that the more positive potential in the region of QB allows the electron transfer to be more favorable positive potential or, or less negative potential allows more negative charge of the electron, okay? So that's quite consistent with what we would expect. Something to do with the electrostatic environment of QB is important for determining how well it can take a negative electron. But now, let's look at another one. Let's mutate this residue. It's a glutamic acid in, in the H subunit, which is a, another subunit that caps the whole structure. Taking away this negative charge will also allow other residues to become more ionized. So there will be some compensation of the loss of that negative charge. Let's see which ones can ionize further. Well, it turns out that these ones, which are very close to the quinone, can ionize more. And since they're closer to the quinone, their influence is greater than the one we've taken away. So it turns out we take away a negative charge and we actually make the environment around QB more negative, which is you know, obviously at first sight counterintuitive. But when we think of how proteins really work and how complicated they are and the nature of electrostatic energies, then it's not too surprising. And in fact, if we look at this mutant, which is down here, we find that taking away the negative charge here has made the equilibrium constant less favorable 
because it's made the potential near QB actually more negative by virtue of this reshuffling of the ionization state of this complicated region. And what it has actually done is that it's downshifted the PK of the glutamic acid into a region where it influences the, uh, the equilibrium constant at lower pH. Okay. Uh, and we can do this with a, with a variety of other residues and get some idea of how this complicated electrostatic interplay really take, takes place. Now, this region of the, uh, of the protein is not only involved in setting the sort of uh, equilibrium properties of the secondary quinone, it's also responsible for delivering the protons that must be got to the quinone when we reduce it finally to the quinol, because it, reducing it to the quinol takes two electrons, but also takes two protons. So um, that same region here is responsible for actually providing, in some constructed way, a pathway which allows protons to come from the solution through about 15 angstroms. This is a long distance proton transfer uh, event uh, to be delivered to the secondary quinone. And you can see the sort of range of uh, uh, the scales here. The electron is transferred from the primary donor to the quinones over about 25 angstroms, which actually acts to charge up the membrane electrically. But also the protons must come in from solution over a somewhat equivalent distance, which also contributes to the net charging of the uh, electric potential across the, across the membrane. So the same sort of things happen here. And in uh, some of the work that I've been talking about has been done in my own lab. There's another group in uh, UC San Diego where a lot of uh, the stuff that I'm talking about has been done. And in particular, a very nice work by them, by Pierre Adelroth and Mark Paddock, identified the, the somewhat unexpected role of some surface histidines to be very important for uh, delivering protons to the secondary quinone. In fact, they represent the entry site of the protons into the protein. And uh, the reason why these are important actually comes down to something which we tend to forget about, and that is that the physiological environment is actually not terribly healthy for reactions which involve protons, because there are damn few of them. At pH 7, the concentration of protons is 0.1 micromolar. So if you, uh, especially in a situation where you consider that there may be competition between a cation like a proton and other cations around, you know, there's 100 millimolar sodium or 200 millimolar potassium out there. So there's a huge disparity between cations that might be involved in various kinds of charge neutralization processes. And to compensate for that, there are a number of devices in proteins which actually facil facilitate working at high turnover rates and also uh, against a, a very unfavorable competition of other cations. And one of these things is something I call fuel injection, which is that these histidines uh, are partially protonated at neutral pH, which provides effectively a much higher concentration of protons locally than just the average appearance or disappearance or comings and goings of protons in solution at 0.1 micromolar. So if we take these histidines away, 0.1 micromolar protons just doesn't do it, and they get in and arrive much too slowly to really contribute to the possible turnover times of, these, uh, of the re reactions going on down here in the secondary quinone. Other residues which, when mutated, kill off proton delivery include the two that we've been talking about so far because they are right next to the quinone and they are actually involved in the sort of last step. They're the things that actually hand off the protons to the secondary quinone. And a few other residues, not all, not all of the acidic residues, but a, but a select few of the acidic residues are specifically involved in, uh, um, in delivering the protons. And it turns out that if we mutate this same aspartic acid residue before, we find that the first proton, which has to get to the secondary quinone in order to allow the second electron to be delivered, is blocked. Whereas if we mutate the glutamic acid, again, the same glutamic acid that was responsible for the pH dependence that we were talking about before, that delivers the second proton. So after the second electron has been transferred, we have a, a quinol anion and then a proton is taken up and it comes from this glutamate. So the pathway apparently bifurcates and with uh, a, a number of um, other studies that we've done over the last few years, 
this is the sort of the overall idea as to how the proton transfer pathway works. It, the protons enter at this surface site, which consists of these histidines, comes through the proton, uh, through the protein, although quite possibly also involves buried water molecules. There are water molecules in here which uh, can be very vaguely seen or if you can't see, if you have a space in a protein in an x-ray structure, the chances are it's not empty. If it's big enough to have a water molecule, it probably will, but if that water molecule is very mobile, you can't see it. So there's a lot of space in here which can contain water molecules. So the protons are conducted through water molecules, but especially these acidic residues, to this aspartic acid. And then this, is either, this either hands off a proton to this uh, carbonyl group, of the, uh, of the quinone, or it goes to this glutamic acid and is then handed off to this carbonyl group. So the, the work that we're doing now, which is sort of predicated on this, this, much of this work has been going on for the last 10 years, but some of the conclusions that I've given you are actually quite recent. Uh, we're interested in the detailed mechanisms as to what, is, what are the properties of a residue in here which is functional as a proton carrier. Uh, what, uh, is the specific PK critical? Um, how, how far can you take the PK of a group away from what we think of as being ionizable before it becomes unuseful? In some cases, you can convert these into, say, a threonine or a serine. Not something you would think of as being ionizable, but protonatable, transiently. So there's a wide range of possibilities as to uh, what really is critical as to whether these residues can work the way they, they appear to. Um, and uh, with that, I'll just uh, acknowledge that um, most of the experimental work I've, be, I've talked about has been done by a fellow who started off as a graduate student, but he refused to leave. He became a postdoc and then a senior scientist. He's been with me since 1986, I think. Uh, so Eiji Takahashi has done a lot of this. Uh, a dear colleague of mine in Hungary, Peter Marotti, visits me quite regularly to do some of this. And Vladimir Shinkarev, who uh, escaped from Russia in 1989 when the wall came down and never went home either. Uh, and then uh, a longtime friend, colleague, and it turns out brother-in-law, Les Dutton, who uh, uh, works in a very similar area. So thank you very much for your attention.